morning, everyone. I hope you had an amazing and relaxing evening last night. God knows we discussed some emotional things yesterday, and that's probably going to happen again today. Important things to discuss, but we do want to jump right into it because we have a lot of things to discuss today. So again, we're going to start the day off with in a good way with our mother-daughter combo of Kathy and, pardon, mother-son, did I say? <laughs> no, mine's a mother <laughs> Sorry, Dakota. <laughs> Mother-son combo of Kathy and Dakota.
Miigwetch, miigwetch, miigwetch. Come on in, have a seat, people. Next, I'm going to call on our amazing elders, Lucy Kakagamek and Maggie Chisel, to start our day off in prayer. So good morning, everybody. I hope everybody had a good, restful night. And uh, it's a good, good morning out there. Good spring morning. Pujo, what you, what you now are, Knamaga Pishag, and Nakumak Minak Chikishamando. Kashawen go quigash, Kauski Kishak. A me gage, Gijim Hyan, Huiga, back and got egg mina, our cheat to him. I am here. Shamando, do my chum nan. Nakumgo, Minahoga Pichi. Guys, seg me one scrag, a cominic canop, a canem shag when got in bayak. Minaonic can again mean shag. Ewa waka weak. Nakumgo. Miss Minish Baxon, Gong Shaman, do you show in the man who am out you do? Gonok Magluk, a cominot than hook. Should we show in my door? I wish I'm going to Samoan. I go mean in Samoan, Jumina, Jimmy Gwen, I go Gagita in the moon, Jimmy Gwen, who I'm in a cooking is to go knock, Knamagewan. They meet the monana Kerguanak, Gunak, and the parents, Magaya, Dunik, Higumak, Magabas guys, you wish again the mod, is not going to go out, Nijan Shuan. So when my daughter says it, my daughter, but yet again, my daughter, my daughter. Oh God, our Father, our Creator, we acknowledge you this morning and give you thanks for the night rest. We pray for renewed strength, renewed mind and bodies this morning. We need your strength and grace for today. We ask, we commit this conference to you, and we ask your presence. We ask your wisdom your knowledge to each one of those that will be representing and the educators, the workers here. We ask you for understanding as we continue to uh, start this new day. May Jesus we Amen. Good morning, too. I had a, a good rest. I think I did, but I could have slept for another couple hours too. But um, I was telling uh, my sister over there, I knew I shouldn't have said anything about spring yesterday. <laughs> but anyway, Makao de Kwe Nin, Namendo Tem, Upishokang Donji. My English name is Maggie Chisel. I live in Thunder Bay, and I'm from uh, Lac Soul First Nation. And I just want to thank the Creator, too, this morning for all his goodness. And um, one of the things I, uh, I vowed to myself after uh, I was, like, uh, I was, uh, I don't know if it was diagnosed or if um, it was confirmed that I was cancer-free back in March 21st. And one of the things that I I told the Creator was in my in my thankfulness for Him, I would always acknowledge His goodness. So this morning I just want to acknowledge the goodness that He has showed me. And over the years, many many years already, there's things I can pick out that I know it had to be Him, nobody else. So, and this is one time again that it had to be him. And uh, the other thing is the traditional medicines. One of the things I asked right at the beginning was uh, prayer. I had four people praying for me for, uh, two of them went on the fast. And then I asked uh, two young men if they would prepare medicines for me. And that's what I did. They prepared medicines for me, and uh, I took uh, traditional medicines for all that 
time from March to March. So I just want to acknowledge that and encourage people that do have that gift of carrying herbal medicines, please just keep going and uh, teach people, teach our young people. May you add, that's my morning prayer. May God. The elders love my nails. It doesn't get better than that. That's all you need. Approval of the elders. I have so many announcements I need to share with you before we go into the first keynote, but I'm going to talk really quickly. I wanted to share something with you, just a couple words, something that happened this morning that I just thought was a really important lesson. I don't know if anyone in the room believes that everything happens for a reason. And I sure wouldn't say that applies to the youth we lost, because that's a huge price to pay. That's up to the families whether they believe that or not. I'm talking more about the little things that happen every single day, sometimes even annoyances or frustrations that we can either ignore or complain about, or we can try to look for the lesson in them. So I was heading here this morning, and I live about 20 minutes away, not a long drive, and I was about three minutes away when I realized I forgot my cell phone. A sigh from several people that would, that would send them into a panic attack. And I had to do that quick calculation. Do I turn around and go get it and risk being late? What if they have instructions for me? Or do I just accept today's not a day to have a cell phone? So I decided to be brave. <laughs> I thought if our northern community members can go without cell phones all the time, I can do this. I can do it. I'm strong. And then I walked in here, and I knew yesterday that Kobe is un unavailable today. They're not able to present like it says on the agenda. I knew that. But I didn't know what was going to happen instead. And when I walked in this morning, I was informed that in that time slot, we're going to hear from the families. And I thought, if ever, there is a day to forget your cell phone. Today's the day. Because they have no choice but to walk this journey. And if we can choose to keep our phones and our purses, our pockets, whatever, and walk with them even just for a little while, I think that's a price we should be willing to pay. The only exception is the families themselves. Something triggers you and you need to get lost in the cell phone for a while, knock your socks off. <laughs> no one is saying anything. But to the rest of us, and I realize sometimes there's work demands, but that's what grieving is like. It doesn't care what your work demands are. It demands attention right now. So what I'm asking of all of us is if you can lose the cell phone for the day. Let's hear what they have to share with us. Sound good? Awesome. Miigwech. So I already told you the first announcement that Kobe will not be speaking at 1030 today, that we'll actually be hearing from the families. The other announcements, I'm now going to sound like someone at the airport, but OK, hang on. Trust me for this. So the shuttle for Rhonda Bushy, Everett Bushy, and the Anderson family their flight leaves at 11.30 a.m. tomorrow, so they have to be in the lobby tomorrow morning at 9.45, okay? For Beulah Waboos and the Waboos family, they should be in the lobby for 1.45 as your flight leaves at 3.30. And the Morriso family, I apologize profusely. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be, you need your charter, so you have to be in the lobby at 6.45 a.m. as two trips are required for, to get to the, for the shuttle to arrive at the airport on time. If you forget any of that, I'm going to leave this with the front desk so you can just touch base with them and make sure you have your times for your shuttle. 
Now I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker for today, and we have two amazing keynotes today. Eddie Robinson is here. He's a member of Missinabe Cree First Nation, and he has partial fluency in Nishnabe Moan, which is the most honest thing I've ever heard. He has spent more than 30 years participating, leading, and facilitating in cultural events. Eddie believes the ability to achieve a mutually respectful relationship with indigenous communities is by creating culturally safe environments together. Eddie currently travels internationally speaking on Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's calls to action, allyship, anti-oppression, diversity, inclusion, and equity, historical trauma, and indigenous ways of knowing. His goal and purpose is to help elevate the collective consciousness of global citizens by building capacity for Indigenous people and being an agent of change. Please help me to welcome Eddie Robinson. Wow, where is everybody? <laughs> Sleeping? <laughs> Am I the opener? I think you already heard a song, right? So I'm gonna sing you another one. So this drum here was actually a gift to me uh, from Ron Rice, uh, the BC uh, Association of Friendship Centers. And so one of the interesting things about this, this painting here on the drum is it talks about us moving together, right? other than some of the Cree people's mouth watering right now when they see these geese up here. <laughs> Talks about us moving together, us moving in a direction together. And so that's what we're talking about with truth and reconciliation. You know, unfortunately, it's just, it's just another word of what we've been saying for the past five, six decades. And so, you know, one of the major things that we talk about is, you know, people listening or hearing us. Um, but when we sing and when we share those prayers or we sing in that way or that way of knowing, you know, we're sharing our, our feelings and our ways, ways of being with, with the Creator, with the spirits. And that way we sing is uh, considered like a spirit language from everything I've been taught. And that's our form of prayer. Um, and people have that form of prayer in terms of singing all over the world. And you know, the more I travel around the world and see, see the things I've, you know, witnessed and been, been part of, um, the more I understand myself, the more I understand our, our culture, the more I understand our ways of knowing. And so, this song I'm going to sing for you is, uh, if I can ask you to stand up. I don't know if you can turn the lights out. So I'm going to ask Jessica to go around and pick your pockets. No, just kidding. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm just joking. So I just want you to close your eyes for a minute. All right. Breathe in. Breathe out. Oops. <laughs> Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. So while I'm singing, I just want you to think about your family. I want you to think about those children, Bonoji. I want you to think about our community. I want you to think about er everything that you love. You know, think about that in your heart. I'm going to sing the song for you. Oh, 
So that's, you know, for us, that form of singing is uh, that spirit language. It's how we communicate with creation. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to say was um, when we're talking about, you know, our ways of knowing, it's, I've always been taught a lot by my elders, uh, by healers and spiritual people I've worked with that this uh, way of life that we have, or this way of prayer, or this way of knowing. Shoot the gun? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Can you tell I'm from the 70s? <laughs> um, is, uh, is between us and the Creator. You know, it's be it, that's your relationship. And, you know, in my earlier, you know, years of starting out, I was very angry. You know, when I was learning about culture and spirituality, very angry young man, you know, protesting all the time down at Queen's Park. <laughs> you know, it just, um, I was just angry, and I just needed an outlet for that. So, so I used to beat up white kids. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> One of the important things that Thomas King has taught me about teaching this really, really heavy topic or talking about this really heavy thing is, is that we need to laugh. And he asked me, when I sat with him for two days one time, just in his house, having coffee, having lunch. And if you haven't heard of Thomas King, you know, uh, Google him, <laughs> read his books. They're pretty good. But one of the things he said was, Eddie, if I wrote about all the awful things that have happened to my people or to our people, he goes, would you read it again? I said, well, you're assuming I'd read your book, right? <laughs> I said, probably not. He goes, exactly. He goes, people need to smile. And he goes, as, as insensitive as it sounds that we're talking about these very emotional th topics, he goes, you got to cut it with humor. And when I think about our people gathering in ceremonies and I think about our people, you know, the, at the ceremonies I've been to, even fasts, you know, even Sundance or... Wherever I was at the time, people were always laughing, and they were teasing, and they were joking, you know. Unfortunately, my family joked to the point of abuse. <laughs> Still carrying that around. It's my trigger. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anybody watch the 1491s? No? Oh, okay. I have to school you. <laughs> and the reason why I'm not wearing a suit is because I can't fit them anymore. <laughs> the pandemic. <laughs> I think I put on, let's see here, when I started out, it was 192, now I'm 235. <laughs> I can't even close my jacket. So that's why I'm wearing this cool shirt from Blue Notes. <laughs> that's the only thing that could fit. <laughs> so it's, 
And it's about making fun of ourselves, right? And it's okay, you can make fun of me, I don't mind. Um, but, you know, growing up in the city, when we're talking about truth and reconciliation, I would have thought, you know, if we go there, are we going to get a check? <laughs> are we going to get an honorarium for going? Are we going to get paid? You know, because a lot of these things, sometimes we come to conferences, we come to uh, workshops, you know, people, you know, back where I was in Toronto at the time would get 10 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever, to help us, you know. And so looking beyond that, looking beyond what that meant, you know, so when we look at our ways of thinking and our, our body of work, we look at the Indian control of Indian education, you know, there's a PDF online, you can Google it. After, after that document, there was uh, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, a really extensive document, really some amazing thinking in there. I know there's some scrutiny about it, but there was some really good thinking around there. And then after that, it became, you know, I'm sure a lot of other documents and surveys and, and you know, uh, environmental scans and policy papers and all that kind of stuff. And now we have Truth and Reconciliation, which is a vehicle for a lot of people to walk with us in allyship, to walk with us in critical friendship. And so these are all the words, these buzzwords that are being thrown around today in a lot of the social worky groups and educational um, realms, you know, critical friends. Are we critical friends? Are we allies? And, you know, there's a lot of, like, questions about that. And, you know, is allies, you know, uh, a term of war, term of conflict, you know, is critical friends, you know, but it's about relationship. And so when I came here yesterday, um, I reached out to my, my relatives because they have a, a First Nations hub here, uh, Missinabi Cree, and they just opened. And so I wanted to go visit them right away. And so that's what I do whenever I go to a city, I just go just walk around and take a walk, walkabout kind of thing and look at what's happening. And uh, they were so happy. And so after I did that, I went there and hung out with their youth and talked to their youth. And I came back here and I stole a whole bunch of your gloves and took them over there to the to the youth, <laughs> some hockey pucks. So if you notice that it, it you know dwindled, that was me. <laughs> it went to good use though. And I just thought those gloves were so cool with the bear on it. <laughs> and I went and gave it to those youth and I sat with them till 11:45 uh, last night, talking with them about culture, about ceremony. We did some ceremonies over there. And, you know, that's my family. I found out, like, all of them are, like, related, first, second cousins. And it just felt good to sit there with them and, and talk with them because a lot of them are misunderstood, like myself. And so growing up in Toronto, you know, I grew up with a very violent family, and I know you Crees know about violence, you know, especially uh, end of the month. <laughs> And for, for me, at the end of the month was what? Tell me what the end of the month was. Anybody? Food, yeah. What else? What kind of food? KFC? What was the end of the month for most of us living in the city? Sandy, go ahead. You got your check. It's check day, right? And so back in the day, you used to call it welfare check, right? You get your check day. Everybody gets their check. It's a big celebration, like fiscal year. Everybody's bringing <laughs> all their, you know, boxes of beer on their shoulder, not putting it in a cart, <laughs> carrying it on their shoulder with their KFC and bucket, uh, you know, bucket of chicken under one arm. That really was a thing. I'm not joking. So in Toronto, when you pull up to, you know, I lived in poverty, so I lived in uh, low income. Do I have any toothpaste here? Okay. <laughs> I, like, I can feel something. And I'm like, I don't know. So... It, the one thing about growing up in poverty in Toronto was that everybody was poor. So it wasn't just us. So I grew up with people from Jamaica, from Trinidad, uh, from Pakistan, people who were Muslim, uh, Sikh, you know, Hindu, uh, spoke Urdu. Like, I mean, all these things I learned about diversity in the hood, you know, and about who I was. And the other Indians that were there in the hood, those are the people I first fought when I got there. Because <laughs> those are the ones that jumped me. <laughs> and that's true, I'm not even joking. I remember when I first, my first day in low-income housing um, in Toronto, 
after I left my grandparents. So I lived with my grandfather until I was about 10, just no better anyway. Because at the end of the month, all my aunts and uncles would go there and pull all their checks together and get as much beer as they could, right? And so when I moved in with my mother, because she finally got into housing, it took her like 10 years, um, first day on the street, she goes, go get a loaf of bread. So I don't know if she meant steal it or get, you know, get one. So I just left. And then, uh, and I'm not joking, like I used to go and steal bread in the morning. So in the morning, if you live in Toronto on the Danforth near Jones, IGA used to put their bread out in the front in the morning. So I used to go up and grab a couple of loaves and walk back. <laughs> Nobody would say anything. And uh, so I was walking to the store and these three native kids, I'm like, all right, other Indians, you know. And then they they were like, what the, are you looking at? You know, F this, F, don't look at me. And I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> so I kept walking to the store and I could hear them behind me. And they're scrambling around to pick up a, to pick up a rock. I could hear them. And then I was just like timing it, closing my eyes, walking towards the store. I was like listening to see when he was going to throw it. And as soon as I heard his like jacket, I just ducked. And a rock went over my head and cracked the window of the store. And the store, the, the guy that owned the store came running out and asked what was going on. I'm like, I don't know. These guys are throwing rocks. So he chased them out. So when we got the bread, left, went back to the building. And they were waiting for me by the door to the building, three of them. All right. <laughs> so I threw the bread down. See, the thing, at, at 10 years old, I was already fighting my uncles, right? I was already cultivating violence. You punched me in the face, it didn't phase me. And so I just, I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's, let's do this then. You know, it's interesting that three of the kids that I met in the first day are other indigenous kids and were fighting. So they came at me and, you know, I noticed that growing up, you punch kids that don't know how to fight in the stomach, you knock the wind out of them really easy and they just, they get scared. So that's what I did, I just punched them all in the stomach and they were just like, Ooh! and I grabbed my bread and went inside. <laughs> and I've been, you know, in martial arts all, all my life, I've been, you know, first time I went to karate, I was like six years old. I have a black belt in Shotokan. I was supposed to fight pro when I was 30. Oh. Yeah, awesome. Oops. <laughs> so you know, I've been in martial arts my whole life, and that's kind of what kept me out of jail, because it did discipline me. It just let me, it allowed me to use enough power to defend myself, right? Um, so that was the thing. It was that was my life. That was a part of my life. And the reason why I'm sharing story is that's how we teach. It's not just me talking about myself me sharing my story right with you because i want to talk about myself no it's using it as a narrative it's using it as a tool to teach that's how we teach and so i didn't go to school i dropped out in grade nine first three months i went to grade nine for three years <laughs> each time i dropped out after the first month anybody else no just me <laughs> yeah. Hey, we, we got a lot in common. <laughs> Were you the kid that beat me up? I'm just <laughs> I think it was the older cousins that came after me later. But it's growing up in the city, that was the thing was that we were in the hood, and all these other kids that were in the hood with us, that's the one thing we had in common was that we were poor. And so when we went to these schools with all these privileged kids, where I was, it was privileged white kids or privileged Greek kids, right? They had money. Parents were driving fancy cars at the time, Mercedes, who knows. You know, there was no DeLoreans, but I hoped. <laughs> and it was just that kind of element where, you know, actually the, the school I went to, a lot, of the pe a lot of the kids in there were casted for Degrassi. Degrassi, because I live close to there. Uh, Degrassi Junior High, Degrassi High, all that kind of stuff. Those are kids that were all in the neighborhood that... You know, look down their nose at us because we were from, you know, we were from the hood. Um, and so that was the thing. And when you think about that, I thought about all my relatives living in the city at the time. So I had eight uncles and three aunts, tons of cousins. This is just my mom's side. It's not even my Cree side. I'll tell you about my Cree side in a minute. <laughs> so um, they're all living in, in low-income neighborhoods. They're living in Regent Park. They were living in Parkdale, Jane and Finch, 
Rexdale, Malton. So we were like, I had experience in all those neighborhoods because all my family was living in all those places. Keel and Eglinton. And that's what it was. It was about drinking, getting your check, partying, fighting. It was just, we were so cultivated in violence. It was just, you know, I had this thing later I'm going to talk about. Um, but yeah, I never went to school because, of, you know, the school I went to at the time, Danforth Tech in Toronto, in 90, 91, you know, I'm almost 50 years old now. And one of the things that it said in the newspaper was, don't send your kids here. It was the most violent school in Toronto, you know, and there was, it had the largest number of gangs at the time. It was in the Toronto Sun, don't send your kids. That's the school I went to. Those were the guys I grew up with. One of the guys that was on the same street started one of the largest gangs in Canada called Blake Street Massive. Those were my friends. Those were the guys I played chess with and played handball with. We were like Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> it wasn't like big gangsters. It just kind of evolved into that. And so, you know, when I think about all of that and all my life, and then when I go to the reserve and talk about culture or go to communities, well, you're from the city. You're a city Indian. You know, you don't know shit. <laughs> In the beginning, oh, you must be white because of how fair I am. It would just hurt. I'm not white. My dad's Cree. <laughs> My mom's Ojibwe. You know, I'm like, I'm sorry, I like skin, but it doesn't change who I am. And and that's it. When I did the ancestry thing, just I kind of jump all over the place here. How many cousins do you think I have? Take a guess. I'll give I'll give three guesses. And I'll give 20 bucks to the person who gets closest. Yeah. Yeah. Throw a number up. 600. Got 600. We have 700. <laughs> Anybody else? One last guess. 1,000? 36,000 cousins. So we can't date anybody in this room. <laughs> I'm related to some... People all the way over into like Alberta. So it, it was phenomenal. And I showed my ex, my ex wife, like, look at this. She's like, our kids are not moving north. <laughs> <laughs> so it just felt good, you know, to know that I have all these relatives right across Canada. It felt really good. So I'm, I'm not even joking. Some of us in this room are probably related. Second, third, fourth cousin. I remember guys I used to sing with on the Powell Trail, um, Janskum. Um, uh, the youngest one, Dean. He'd call me up every once in a while because we connected on <laughs> ancestry. What, Jay? Danny Dean. <laughs> hey, cousin. Just starts singing, what? <laughs> Into the phone. I'm like, Hey, Dean, what's up? <laughs> just just know right away who it is. And he's like, we're related. He kept, every time he just does that, he goes, we're cousins. I, can't, I couldn't believe we were cousins. Sitting across from each other at the drum all these years, I sang Powell for 30 years, and we were related. Related to Chichu, Etherington, um, Eacham, Apostapish, Fletchers. And so when I met the Fletchers in Moose Factory, because most of the time I'm like, hanging out with my Ojibwe family, right? And so when I started discovering my Cree family, and I went up there to Moose Factory, and I met the Fletchers, they look at me like, I'm not related to you. <laughs> like, to get this kind of look. Because I'm so short. I'm like, whoa, I'm, I'm almost six feet. I'm 5'11 and three quarters. <laughs> when you see, has anybody seen the Fletchers from Moose Factory? Anybody? Put your hand up. How tall are they? It's pretty tall, right? Like six five, taller than that, right? Yeah. There was a uh, Pat, the old man Pat, and then it was son Pat. They were like the old man was like six foot nine, and his son was like seven foot two. I'm like, and then I found out they used to trap and hunt with the smalls. And how tall are the smalls? <laughs> so you have these really big crees and these really small crees <laughs> hunting and trapping together, and so. There must something must have happened because then you have me <laughs> somewhere, some happy medium, and so that's the history of our families, and this is the history of our narrative in truth and reconciliation, 
And I know we're talking about really heavy things, but it's about the intersex. How can we connect? How can I com connect myself to your story? How can I talk about who you are? How can I find a place where we can discuss and where you can smile and where we can work together, where we can be allies to each other, you know, regardless of our beliefs, regardless of our language, regardless of our culture. You know, my grandmother was a devout Catholic and she was my roommate until I was like eight. <laughs> we used to sleep back to back. And I could just smell A535, man, it was so bad. Like every time I went to bed, it, just, it was just on me. <laughs> it was in my nose. <laughs> I kind of miss it. And so, you know the fun thing she used to do to put me to sleep at night? She used to smoke matinee, right? So she'd be in bed smoking. And so she'd have her spittoon by the bed, right? This bin, this coffee can, where she'd lean over and spit it. <laughs> so this is my life. And so she's talking to me, and she spoke Nishnabi Moen fluently. But she talked to me in English, and I asked her, why don't you teach me Indian? She goes, because I want you to learn how to speak English. And then she'd write my name with the ember of the cigarette <laughs> in the dark. My, name, my nickname was Chubby or Tubby. I was like, you know, 100 pounds at one years old. <laughs> no joke. I, I wish I had a picture. I'd put it up there for you. Ate a lot of spaghetti sandwiches. <laughs> Anybody have spaghetti sandwiches? See, when I say this to other people, they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, man. The next day after the spaghetti is like sitting in the sauce, it tastes much better. You throw it in the frying pan with some margarine. Margarine. <laughs> you stir it around and you put it on a sandwich. And so I gave this to my daughter. Her, her mom is Greek, and so they're really amazing cooks, really good food. And so when I made this for her, she's like... Looking at like, I'm like, trust me. Just trust me, okay? Just try it. She's eight years old. She tries it. She's like, wow, this is good. <laughs> so me and her like spaghetti sandwiches. <laughs> and so it's finding that commonality with each other because that's what relationship is. And so I work right now with a team in Halton Region, and I'm really trying to teach the municipality and the region, municipalities and regions. So the regions I work with are the wealthiest in the country. They got money but I'm still not full-time. That should tell you something. My team is interns and summer students. And we've already got an MOU signed with the, the Mississaugas of the credit. And so, you know, that's about relationship. And I spent as much time as I could with Chief Laform, or uh, Ogima, we call him, I got everybody calling him Ogima now, finally. And uh, spending time with him. And I remember we went to the AMO conference. If you don't know what AMO conference is, it's the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. They have a conference in Ontario. So is there anybody here from like a First Nation specifically representing? Anybody? Well, if, if you know people that are representative councils, I want you to pass this message along. So at the AMO conference, you can have delegations with the ministers. And most of the First Nations in Ontario don't know that because there's only two First Nations at this provincial con conference. Two. There was the, the chief of West Bay, and then there were Six Nations. And so when I brought Chief Laform there, who's now become a good, dear friend of mine, he's like, where is everybody? And so they weren't there, because they're not being told. So that's what I'm here to do as well is teach, you know, talk about this journey about truth and reconciliation and our own narratives because our own narratives are going to be very different from each other and how we go through this process. So nobody's being told about this delegation in AMO and, and it was just we're so separate from each other. We're in like these silos. Just like if I believe in culture, I can't talk to someone who's Catholic or Christian, right? But like I said, my grandmother was a devout Catholic, and every night before I went to bed, after she drew my name with her cigarette, <laughs> she would say her beads, right? She would say her rosary. And I just remember like hearing her and her dentures clicking. <laughs> it was soothing to me, you know, like, and I'd fall asleep. <laughs> and, and it was just, that was who I, you know, slept back to back with. You know, that was my warmth every night. You know, and that that maybe shaped the kindness in my heart, you know. 
maybe I would have went further down that path of hurting people or hurting myself. And so, you know, that's why I don't judge, you know, Christianity. Uh, I know there's just bad people everywhere, right, that do bad things. But when I think about someone's spirituality and their way of knowing and their prayer, that's between them and the Creator. That's not for me to judge. And one of the most amazing things, I don't know if you were there, uh, but we did uh, cultural competency training in Timmins at the Friendship Center. Your first day of work, right? Yeah, I like to swear a lot, but I won't swear here. But so I'm doing this workshop, three days work, three day workshop in Timmins with my co-facilitator at the time, and people were really resistant. They were calling the culture devil's work and and whatnot, and that's fine. I understand. And then I sat down and I talked about you know our way of knowing and respecting each other, and you know if you don't want to participate in certain things, that's fine. That's okay. I'm not, I'm not compromising your spirituality or your way of knowing. And so I was pushing against this tide the whole way. And right at the very end, this beautiful Cree woman gets up and starts speaking Cree. It talks about religion and talks about our ways of knowing and that she's a believer in both. And she's speaking in Cree. And I'm sitting back and I'm like, my foot in my mouth, I'm like, oh, like I, I just got it at that moment. Like why, would, why, would, why didn't we have her up? Why didn't we have the community up talking about, instead of us coming in there, well, this is cultural competency and this is the colonization timeline and this is what you need to do and that, coming in there like a solution-based attitude. Where does that come from? And, and I was talking with some of your colleagues about this yesterday. So think about a classroom, you know, and this is in Sheila Cote Meek's book, you know, Decolonizing the Classroom. So who sits at the front of the class? You. <laughs> Are you sitting at the front of the class? Who typically and stereotypically sits at the front of the class? It's okay, you can say the name, just be, shout the stereotypes out. The nerds, right? The teacher's pet. The keeners, right? The people that can't see the chalkboard. <laughs> Who sits at the back of the class? <laughs> the bad kids, right? The people, the cool kids are, oh, sorry, all oh, the cool kids are over here. The bad kids are over here. <laughs> and, we, and we accept this. And so when we put our hand up in class, what do we have to have? We have to have the right answer. And when we don't have the right answer, what happens? Our peers laugh at us. Do the, does the teacher or educator correct that? No. So this is the, still the environment our kids are in, right? This is still the environment our youth are experiencing. And when we come into rooms like myself, rather than have a relationship with you, I have to come in with a solution-based attitude. I've got to give you an idea, a thought. But all those answers are here, right? One of the hardest things we do as human beings is face ourselves, the introspection. Look at ourselves in the mirror. Accept all the things we've done, whether they're good or bad. And so when we look at our children that are going through that right now, you know, it's like really unpacking that stuff. Where does that come from, that setup? Well, it comes from colonization and colonialism and imperialism. What do you mean by that? Well, think about the kings and queens back in the day, you know, before they came over here and spoiled it. <laughs> they, they used to do what? They used to cultivate the land. How did they cultivate the land? In straight lines. It's like they're farming us in classrooms. They plow the, 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 uh, the fields in straight lines. Did we do that? No. We didn't cultivate that. So when they showed us their technique and we were better at it than they were, what did they do? In the Indian Act, they outlawed us being, as being farmers for pro profit because we became so good at it. When they taught us Beethoven, Mozart, math, we became really good at it. And so what did they do? They took it away from us, put us in residential schools so that we wouldn't be better or smarter than them. But we are. We're just hurt. And so I was told I was stupid my whole life. I was a dumb Indian. 
I wasn't smart. I had learning disabilities. You know, um, I was violent. I was disconnected. I don't know how many times I've seen on report cards, slow learner, slow learner. It's like, F you. <laughs> FNMI. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Please don't call our kids an acronym. <laughs> so um, that's what I'm going to get. Actually, sorry, not to digress too much. Who the F and am I? Because <laughs> when I was working with TDSB at the time, that's what they call calling the indigenous kids. All oh, those F and am I kids. All oh, those. I'm like, why do you keep swearing at those kids, man? <laughs> but it's it's thinking about all these stigmas we carry around with us, these stereotypes that we weren't smart. If you look at our ancient bundles and our drawings, you'll see diagrams of atoms and energy. Um, the nucleus of an atom. I took the blanket exercise from Canada Roots. They tried to hire me, but I'm too rogue, too nomadic. Maybe I'm a hunter-gatherer, I don't know. <laughs> and I condensed it to 30 minutes. And it still had the same impact. Mm hmm. So, and it's not mine. I just took a bunch of different concepts, pulled them together, and I said, well, this could be quicker. And it's had the same impact. So if you ever want to learn it, I'll teach you. And you can build on it, make it your own. We kind of did it in Timmins a little bit, but I perfected it since then. <laughs> Add my own taste and flavor to it. So the things I'm doing now, I'm speaking all over the world. You know, I spoke for, you know, corporations and from cannabis to RBI and Burger King, Under Armour. Under Armour sent me a whole bunch of cool stuff. So I get all this kind of gigs and, and I get all this stuff and I just give it away, right? It's, it's, that's how I am. I'm just generous. I'm kind. I'll just give it away. And I just learning, I'm like, why? Why are these people asking me to go speak all over the place? Am I smart or something? Because I was always told I was stupid. And so when I look back at my report cards and I look back at my, my experience in the classroom, it doesn't add up, gr dropping out of grade nine. So I went to Cambrian College at 27 years old, and I took the Child and Family Worker Program. And I dropped out after a year. And then Roger Chum called me up. Anybody know Roger? Amazing. I love Roger. Tell him I send my love. <laughs> he called me up. He goes like, I didn't know who he was. I knew his brother. I sang with his brother at Powell's once in a while. He was like, what are you doing? Don't drop out. Eddie, let me fix this for you. I'm like, all right, what are you going to do? He goes, do you ever hear of a challenge exam? I'm like, no. He goes, I'm going to get these challenge exams for you so you don't have to drop out. I'm like, cool. And so he organized, him and Martino Wazalmik, organized this whole challenge exam thing for me at Cambrian College where I went in and I challenged the whole semester. I got A pluses in everything except English. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I was like, because the English department, <laughs> yeah, he was like, yeah wouldn't do a challenge exam for me. And when I went to go talk to the professor, the, the instructor, this is what he said to me. It doesn't even make sense. I'm like, how are you teaching? <laughs> he goes, Eddie, if we're in a race and you came in second place, can I give you first? I'm like, what does that have to do with a challenge exam? He's like, I can't do it, man. I'm like, all right. He didn't say man, but I, that's my way. I, that's my version of it. And I'm like, it doesn't, so I got, I got, an, I got a fail. And so it brought my GPA down from 4.0, I think 3.9 or something, 3.85, somewhere around there. And so I had to retake it. So I went to, uh, what's the college in Peterborough? No, college. Fleming. Fleming, thank you. Fleming. So I signed up, signed up for an online course at Fleming. Oh, there's so many funny stories along the way. I wish I had more time to tell you all of them. So I get to Fleming. I sign up for the course. I do an online version. I pass it with an A+, 100%. Second part, I do an online course, and part of it, I have to go in class and present. And so I'm in there, I come in, I start presenting, I start talking about culture and stuff like that. She goes, did you read the assignment? I'm like, I think so. <laughs> she goes, I'm going to give you five minutes. Go outside and read it, come back. I'm reading it, reading it, like, oh, <laughs> I misread it because I skimmed. <laughs> It was supposed to present on a website. It wasn't supposed to present the idea for a website. 
<laughs> so yeah, I came in, I presented, I looked at a website really quickly, scrolled through it. I'm like, okay, cool. Went in, presented, and got an A plus. <laughs> Like, so all this stuff is then adding up. So I, I missed my undergrad, went straight into my master's. I have a graduate diploma in urban, urban environments. And I unofficially got accepted for my PhD. So this stuff isn't adding up. This dumb Indian, slow learner isn't adding up for me. You know, when I was a, you know, younger, I used to go to the Spadina Library and copy out the, li uh, the dictionary, just so I can improve my vocabulary. When I was taking my master's and all these people are throwing around words like pedagogy and epistemology and, you know, discourse and the dichotomy and hegemonic, I'm like, what the heck are these guys saying? I'm like writing it down, I'm like, hegemonic, how do you spell that? H-E-D-G-E. <laughs> -E. <laughs> I didn't know what they were saying. And so I'm sitting there with all these, you know, academics and I'm writing all these words down. I'm not taking notes, I'm writing down words so I can go define them later. So I can talk with them, because we, we weren't communicating. And so I did all that, and then I did really well. One of my, actually just one of my class projects went around the world. Uh, it was just a short film, it was on Air Canada Shorts. Uh, it like premiered in Dubai and Tibet and California. Um, yeah, it was just a short class project I did. Standing in a suit, and I'm dancing like this, and then I'm standing in my regalia, dancing at Young and Dundas Square. It's called Teaching Rock. And so, because I didn't contribute to the class paper, because I did the film with all my resources, my group, I hate group work. Oh, I hate group work. <laughs> There's too many egos in that table. <laughs> they didn't want to put my name on the paper. I'm like, are you for real? And they're like, I'm like, what if I read three pages? They're like, all right. I said, okay, I'll get you, get it to you in a couple hours. So I wrote three pages. Actually, it was probably the better part of the paper. <laughs> I sent it to them, and they added it. And we got an A-plus on our, on our presentation. And so I went back and I changed the film. And the film that I changed had like half a second of the original. And because it had half a second of the original, I got taken up to the ethics committee for plagiarism or for intellectual property or something like that. I'm like, but it's me in it. I'm singing. It's my song that I composed. I'm speaking the language. Like, what do you mean? Oh, because there's a half a second in it. So I ended up fighting with my own group, and most of them were indigenous. I'm like, why are we doing this? I said, why don't they, this went on for a year. I'm shortening the story. <laughs> This is lateral violence. This is internal oppression, right? This is ego. I said, why don't we just give all the proceeds that come in from this film, Teaching Rock, to York University? Okay, that's good. Like, oh, I'm like, why, why didn't you just say that? <laughs> why couldn't we just do that in the beginning? Instead of carrying this drama out for like a year and being mad at each other for no reason. Because of ego? It's like, there's, there's got to be a better way to do this. So thinking about all this, thinking about how I think and how my brain works, I went and got a, an educational assessment. There's nothing wrong with my learning. So I'm like, must be something wrong with my brain. My mom drank while, while she was carrying me. I, I went into that. My brain's healthy. I don't have FAS or FAE. I'm like, something's up. So I go test my IQ a few times, different places. I score close to 140. I'm like, well, that's above average. <laughs> I have a high spatial aptitude for, or have a high aptitude for spatial learning, which means I know how to pack a car, probably because of all those years of powwow. <laughs> it increased my IQ points. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm like, what's the problem? What's holding me back? And... I got diagnosed with complex PTSD, and I got put on medication. And so I was on Zoloft for a long time, <clears throat> and I came off of it because I was depressed, still carrying around all that stuff from the past, you know, the typical thing that a lot of us go through. Dad that wasn't there, left when we were two or three, you know, 
mom that didn't love us because of alcohol, maybe their own pain. And so these are the common things a lot of us experience. That's the intersect because most of us have gone through that adversity. Most of us have experienced that pain. So how can we talk about that pain in a healthy way? How can we not put that on the next generation? Because we've got to turn it over. We've got to use that as our motivator. That, use that as stoking the fire here within to move in a good direction. So if I'm not a dumb Indian, how come they made me believe it till I was like 45? How come I believed it? I was even talking about it in keynotes. Recon reconfiguring my brain. It was reconfiguring all that trauma I went through because of my family. That's what was holding me back. When I went and sat in the classroom in grade 7 and 8, after I saw my uncle get stabbed in the face, or heard about my other uncle strangling my other uncle to death, I didn't care about literacy or numeracy. I was just thinking about surviving. First time I was on the streets in Toronto, I was 11 years old. And I went to go sleep in Withrow Park under the bench for three days after my mom kicked me out because my number one abuser was actually my mom. Uh, spiritual, physical, emotional, mental. The sexual came from other people right? that uh, she didn't protect me from. And so all those kinds of things was carrying around with me. And so how I'm breaking that cycle, you know, I mean, I can't just go out and have a glass of wine. I know that. I can't just be normal with that. So I don't drink. That's my choice. Yeah, I can't smoke cannabis because I don't get high. I just go to sleep. <laughs> and I think it's a waste of weed. <laughs> don't tell that to your youth. <laughs> and so my outlet is documentaries. The thing I get addicted to is learning. Feeding my brain. It's always been like that. Learning about different things. How the connection from quantum physics, mechanics, and cosmology is related to our culture, to our ways of knowing, that energy. Oh, i got 10 minutes. So what is the point of all this? This has been my journey since the 70s, since that first document that came out, Indian Control of Indian Education. This is why we needed it. You think about Wandering Spirit, the first one of the first schools in Toronto, and how it changed hands. And I was actually part of building the uh, education center in Toronto for TDSB, but I didn't get credited for that, which is fine. It's not my idea. I mean, it's an idea I put out there that I want to have for our people. You know, just like the cultural competency training the IFC did, I was part of. I wrote all my ideas on a piece of paper, <laughs> and I signed it, and I gave it to leadership. And then they usually fire me. <laughs> they take their, my ideas. I'm like, it's okay. The well is deep. <laughs> I would have given you more ideas, you know, if you didn't want to include me as being the creator or originator of it. But that's fine. I remember even in college when I was doing my um, research project uh, for NAMI res, Native Men's Residents, they did something. This is what I found. So being as an accommodations counselor, I found that most of the men that were setting up for homes, when they got into the four walls, these four painted white walls, it was a trigger for them. And they kept relapsing in their housing. So putting people in housing isn't necessarily a solution, but that's what we thought as an organization. I'm like, well, what about second stage housing? What about this idea of them being part of a community every night and eating you know, with the counselors and dinner and being able to ex access counselors and, and workshops and the facilities. Maybe that'll kind of give them some a foundation as they transition into this independent living. I don't know if that'll work. <laughs> then I got fired. <laughs> and then they started uh, Sagate. Anyway, I don't know if it's my idea, but it's just interesting. Perfect timing. <laughs> So I'm not giving any more ideas. <laughs> I'm just going to work for myself and just, you know, give them away for free. Um, but it's thinking about the continuity of care. What does that mean? The continuity is, is these documents that our people have always been saying. The continuity of Indian control of education. What's the theme there? Well, we want to be part of the decisions. We want to be there at the table. We want to listen. And they're not including us. 
Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. What's the theme there? How does that connect to truth and reconciliation? You know, do one of those, like, cool uh, forensics, you know, hunting serial killers. We'll hunt the colonists. Put all those pieces of red yarn. Oh, I see what they did here. <laughs> oh, they eliminated the Indian Act here. <laughs> oh, no, they didn't. They brought it back. <laughs> Start connecting all the dots, right? And how it, con it still controls the narrative for us. And that, you know, we're pretty smart. And we always have been. We map the constellations. We map the stars, the eclipses. We understood what quantum physics before it became quantum physics. You know, we knew all that stuff. But for some reason, we've given into this narrative that we're, um, we're not academic or we're not excelling in certain things. I'm not saying all of us do, but there's a lot of people that, that have been. And so we need to turn that narrative around. And so I always use the wheel as an example with the four quadrants. So when I was on my honeymoon <laughs> years ago, 16 years ago, I was in Ephesus, Turkey. Um, and these ruins are over 2,000 years old. And so I look down and I see this circle with four quadrants in it. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So I call the guy over and I say, what is this? He calls everybody over. He says, see this symbol here on the ground? These are business vendors. But this specific vendor has this symbol here because they were a believer in Christ. I'm like, oh. So I took out my flip phone, pulled the antenna up, <laughs> took a picture, and I found it interesting. Because we all see the same sun, we all see the same moon, right? We didn't come up with the circle. <laughs> but it's how we used it. It's how we used those quadrants. Because when you look at the spokes of the wheels out in Montana, there's like 28, 38, some of them are more. It's not just four. But it's how we used it in this framework right now that we're in. So if we use that for good, because when you look at the pe picture, pe uh, pictographs and petroglyphs and scrolls and all that stuff, there's no evidence of this wheel. There's different versions of it but the specific one that a lot of people are using in terms of this pan indigeneity, which is fine, it's cool. I'm not against it. And anyway, I used it for counseling even. Helped my clients that way. So what I say is that if we use this for good, how come we can't use everything else? I used to be this believer after being angry and learning about the culture was, oh, I don't want to learn their education. Ah, that's, I don't want to sell out. I don't want to do that. And so when I learned education, I found that once I got my degree, all these doors opened. And I've been talking about this stuff since I was 23. I'm 50 now. But as soon as I got that degree, that paper, that world we live in out there, unfortunately now, that we have to navigate, put on a suit for people to take us serious, they respect that, right? That's what they opened the door for. So once we get most of us through that door, then we can change the door. Just knock the freaking frame off. <laughs> you know? There doesn't need to be a door that we have to walk through. You know, there doesn't need to be um, those ideas of prescriptive technology, you know? Farming us, like the colonizing the land to being in the classroom to the grids of the cities, right? the straight north, south, east, west thing. That's all urban planning. That's colonialism. This tiles on the ceiling here. All linear. But also I want you to be able to see the linear uh, lens of a circle. You know? And start unpacking all of that. And what I want to leave you with, like I was left with, you know, is just that hope and that that desire to want to learn more, but also to help us move to a place of peace and, and healing and laughter and loving each other, you know? Not in that way. Because <laughs> we're all related. <laughs> but it's just thinking about all these things and how can we do that? How can we 
involve our narrative because it's not just us talking about ourselves all the time. Oh, you know, Eddie's talking about his hard life. So what? You know, we all we've all been there. I've been through worse. I know. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying my life is harder than yours. <laughs> I'm not measuring our trauma. No, I'm just using this to find an in intersect where we can relate, where you might find something familiar, like margarine sandwiches. You know, anybody have margarine sandwiches for school? I used to have the worst lunch. I used to have to go outside to eat. I'm like, margarine again with spam? <laughs> I was the only kid with fried click at school. <laughs> Not even just regular cold click out of the fridge. It was fried. <laughs> so my, what happened to my bread when I got to school? It was yellow. <laughs> it was all molded to the click. <laughs> I was like, I try to bite it, I'm like, ah, I can't, I can't do this. So sometimes I try to trade lunch, and then I'm not happening. <laughs> but anyway, like, well, you can throw it at somebody. I don't know. So it's finding those things, like who had ketchup soup? I had ketchup soup. You know, just start thinking about this, you know, poverty cookbook, <laughs> and start, and start using it as a point and intersect to work with each other. You know. And it's thinking about all those things, you know, what are the 94 calls to action? Have your colleagues, your partners read the 94 calls to action? Have they read the Indian Control of Indian Education? Have they pulled out the relevant parts of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples? You know, and connect them all together because we're still saying the same thing. We want to be part of the process. We want to be part of the conversation. We want to be inclusive of everyone because everyone deserves to sit there. Everyone's voice needs to be heard from young to old, right? And that's where we need to get. And I have a film or a video I want to show you, um, but I want to sing a song for you. I think I need longer than an hour. Usually my keynotes are about two hours. Um, there has been a continuity of oppression, right? Now we have to break that cycle. And we have to start this continuity of care that you were talking about, but this continuity of healing, this continuity of growth, you know, this continuity of our own evolution as human beings and as people. Because when I'm out there on the land, sitting, talking with the trees or the stones or the water, because, you know, I was, wasn't normal growing up. I, you know, I heard things, I saw things that weren't there. Uh, spiritual strength, I guess you could say. And it wasn't until I got out on the land that I really started understanding what those were. And you know, the interesting thing was when I was on band council for Miss and Abbey Cree, I'm still recovering. <laughs> <Just kidding>. uh, <laughs> the thing was, uh, we had this hunting um, referendum or, or forum or something up in Chaplow. And uh, these hunters were sitting there and they're like, I don't know about culture. I'm like, what do you mean? So I start talking. I start talking about teachings and the drum and the sweat and vision quest and all that kind of stuff, which is fine. But then these hunters start talking about how they point the hooves of the deer to the north, right? How, how they place the animal, what they use the insides for. Talk about their hunting stories and how they took care of that animal or they put tobacco down or before they fish, you know, all these kinds of things are how I'm like, what do you mean you're not cultural? That sounds like culture to me. <laughs> Just because you might have a different form of prayer and how you facilitate that, that's very Indian. If, if I heard anything, <laughs> I wanted to hear more from them. I wanted to hear more of their stories being out in the bush, some of the things they've seen, some of the things they've heard, some of the things they can't talk about because it would sound crazy. I've seen some of those things out there. It's not just animals out there. There's spirits out there. And we understood that relationship of energy. We took care of those things. And so it's bringing all those voices together, and how can we do that? <clears throat> but I want to share a quick song before I put this video on. <clears throat> so this is like a healing song. <clears throat>
So I think truth and reconciliation is about relationship. And I think we have to reconnect those relationships to each other in a positive way, not in a negative way. And the last thing I'll leave with before we show this video, I don't know if you got it queued up. Awesome. Is, you know, I can only use examples of how it works. Because when I was developing this relationship for Halton Region with the Mississaugas of the Credit, it started out with, okay, I want to make sure they're heard, I want to make sure they're involved, and I want to make sure that they're part of every process of the MOU. And uh, I did that, but when we went to that AMO conference in Ottawa, I was like on Stacy LaForme's side. If he needed anything out there, I'd bring his luggage to him. I met him, you know, at his hotel every morning. I walked him over to the conference. I got him a coffee, whatever I could do. Checked my ego completely. Who am I? You know, I made sure he had everything. It was about hos hospitality. It was about respect for me and learning from this man. And he's like, why are you here all the time, Eddie? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not, am I bugging you? <laughs> I'm just here to help you. I'm here to be with you, like support you, whatever you need. I'm not going to leave you like wandering around by yourself. Like I'm here on your side. That's what I'm here to do. And then right at the end of it, we're standing at the back after I actually swore at some of the AMO people, which probably should be fired, but whatever. There's this guy that was standing <laughs> at the front and he wouldn't let Chief Laform go on the stage. So this is what I said. So get the F out of the way. <laughs> I moved him out of the way. <laughs> Told Chief Laform to go up. Like, I really do these kinds of things. Because <laughs> I want to protect our people, you know. And for us men, we've lost that path to protecting our community. And so it's reestablishing that, you know, that role again. And right at the end of it, uh, I think I went back to the room and cried after he said this to me because he got on the train after I was the only person that went out to his house when his son passed away and he had the fire going for four days. I went and sang songs out there for him. He goes, Eddie, it was during the pandemic, he goes, you're the only one that came out here. These mayors, all these people that are taking pictures with me all the time, none of them came. I went out there with my, my kids. And then at the ba back to the AMO conference, we're sitting at the back of the room or standing at the back of the room. He goes, you know, can I share something with you? I said, sure. He goes, you remind me of my son. I think I just put my head down. I was like, Whoa. all my daddy issues came up. <laughs> and I was sitting there. I, I still feel emotional about it, but I'm like, thank you. He goes, no, I'm serious, Eddie. He goes, he didn't take shit from anybody. He was funny. He was just, he just wanted to be around him. And he goes, thank you. So I just hugged him. <laughs> and I just think about my own kids. I have eight-year-old twins. I have a 12-year-old son. And just breaking that cycle, you know, of unhealthiness. Being this nerdy dad that... If my son wants to wear pink, I'll wear pink with him to school so he doesn't get teased. You know, I took them to the Stranger Things experience, I took them to Monster Jam, 
I, you know, I'm the guy that, you know, that does everything to make my wife look bad. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I love her. I, I love my ex. We, we have a very amicable relationship. We really respect each other. And maybe that's what's kind of scary for people is that it was so, like, healthy. <laughs> you know, that wasn't just, like, this knockdown fight <laughs> divorce. <laughs> I just said, you have everything, okay? She was like, really? I'm like, yeah. It's all yours. It's just stuff. Why would I take that house from my kids? So all I have is just my belongings now. But why, why do I need that? And that's what I thought about in terms of our leadership. As leaders, we gave everything we had to other people, to people that needed it. I mean, I didn't need just that stuff. What I had was the most important thing that I took away from, from that. And that's the love of my children. The love that they know I'm going to be there for them. That's the continuity of care. Is relationships. Relationships that we have with each other. Respect. So, I'm going to show this video. Like, do you want me to go? Sorry. Am I, eat, am I eating up your time? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just joking, Sandy. Uh, I think like six, seven minutes. You know I'm going to tease you, right? Oh, you know what? While you're showing it, they can get up, grab a coffee. It can play in the background. I'll be around for a little bit before I go and jump on my plane. But I just wanted to say, if you ever need to reach out, just Google me. I'm sure you can find me on LinkedIn. If you ever have any questions or just, I'll, I'm the type of person that if you want to have coffee, it doesn't matter what time, I just love coffee. <laughs> so I'll meet you wherever you want. Um, and it's not that kind of coffee. <laughs> it's just coffee. <laughs> and that's how you say it in Cree, right? In, in, in Ojibwe or Anishinaabe, it's Nibi Shabo Begshkabot Egejibozimik, but in Cree, it's coffee. <laughs> Anyways, we're going to show the video, and I just wanted to say miigwech and thank you. I've come to the Mississauga First Nation community of Skugog Lake in Ontario, Canada. I'm here to learn about the Anishinaabe First Nations practice of vision questing. Here to welcome me is Eddie Robinson. Wayne Bojo. Wayne Bojo. Wayne Bojo. And Wayne Bojo means... I see your light. Yes, and I'm going to learn from you and you can learn from me, and I'm going to respect you and you can respect me. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I want to know about a vision quest. How do you decide to go on one and what are you seeking when you do? One of the main things is it's for us as human beings to re-engage with our original family, our first family, and that's creation. But it's also giving up food and water, giving up of those basic essential needs and physiological needs for creation. So we go and spend time on the land in a singular spot and just pray. And while we're there, we engage and interact with energy, spirits and animals. They know that we're there to pray, to show our gratitude. So it's a way to get back in touch with the Great Spirit. Yes, yes, right. yes. So how did you happen to go on the vision quest? Um, a calling. An unexplainable calling inside that tugs at you. Like a lot of indigenous people in Canada, I lived in poverty, living on the margin. Uh, it was after being in juvenile detention and on the streets that uh, I was actually doing community service hours at one of the local centers in Toronto. And I heard the drum. And that heartbeat of that drum, boom, 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 just called me. And I just started crying. And all I kept thinking was that this is my culture. This is who I am. Eddie met an Anishinaabe elder from Minnesota who advised him to head to the woods, undertake a fast, and seek the spiritual guidance of a vision quest. It was at the end of October. It was minus one. <laughs> they drove me out on an ATV 10 miles into the forest. And 
they put me in my fasting spot and said, we'll see you in three days, and just left me there. Uh, uh, no shelter? No. <laughs> Come on. They said, if you get cold, make a fire. I'm like, okay. And they said, if you see any spirits, just put some tobacco down. I said, okay. And they left. Alone in the freezing woods, Eddie steeled himself for his quest. His life was about to take a new path. Eddie Robinson, a young man of Anishinaabe descent, was barely connected with his nation's spiritual tradition. But now he was on a vision quest on a freezing night miles from help. So you're on your vision quest here at Dreamwood Rock? And it was tough as I was sitting up on a scaffold probably about six feet off the ground. They're not built for comfort because you're supposed to stay awake for three days. So we put your stuff up there in your bundle and you just pray while you're sitting up there. Did you see anything while you were out there? Yeah. There was a spirit bear that came and visited me. Came and sat not even four feet in front of me. I'm like, oh, I gotta give him tobacco. He's coming for his tobacco. And then he just disappeared. He must have ran 60 kilometers an hour. It was surreal to me. And you didn't eat for two days? Three. I didn't eat anything or drink anything for three days. I was crying, yelling, singing. I was just coming apart at the seams out there. I was battling and proving myself to those spirits. But you didn't die. No, it was tough. It was hard. But the hardest thing I had to do out there was face myself. I wasn't sure if it was my imagination or if it was just seeing things because I didn't have food or water. But sure enough, there was this old man that presented himself to me. And I could see him as clear as day. He was just there looking at me. And then he was gone. And that was your vision? That was my vision. Kind of like um, how I interpreted later was that the spirits or the old ones are waiting for me. They're waiting for me to take that path. You took that path? You did. That's the path you took that, yeah. that was a better path than you were on before. Yeah, and sort of like saw it on the road to Damascus. Huh? Yeah. That's where I found my calling. Eddie's vision quest was his key to escaping a life of addiction and violence in Western culture. It was an experience he knew he had to share with other young First Nations people. So then you became a sort of a guru teacher. Yeah. I learned about how the sweat is done. I learned about how the fast is done. I learned how to help with healing and doctoring ceremonies for our people. And all I wanted to do was just keep giving it back. Keep giving it back, right? So now that's your quest. For a lot of people on this nation, they have been disconnected from that way. So I'm here to help support them on their journey back. They've never been in a sweat, and they've never been to a vision quest. We need to reconnect our spirit to this land. We consider creation our first family. There were so many people that want to sit with our first family.
Like Saul on the road to Damascus, Eddie's life was completely changed by a vision of the divine. In his case, it was the great spirit, the manifestation of his people's connection to the land. And like Saul, who became an apostle named Paul, Eddie became a guide for the First Nations people spreading the transformative power of the vision quest. What happens when someone sees or feels what they believe is the presence of God? The simple answer is perspective. It's a moment of understanding. It shows a way forward. Visions happen in the mind of one person, but when someone like St. Bernadette, Charles Mully, Eddie Robinson have the courage to share their vision, it can alter the course of many lives, even change the world. Miigwech, that was amazing. We are going to take a 10 minute break. I feel it's important we get up and move around and get some water, whatever. And then I really, to me, nothing's more important than hearing from the families. So we'll start that at 1045 while we get some things organized. Okay, so get up, move around, be kind to our bodies, and we'll talk to you soon. As Jody mentioned yesterday on the, in that amazing presentation on grief, Sometimes when we're grieving, we just need people to sit with us. And other times, we just need them to hear us. It's not about coming up with the perfect response. It's not about reassurance. It's not about you. <laughs> it's just about holding space. So that's what we want to do right now. We want to honor the inquest families and the seven youth by holding space and giving them an opportunity to speak. First up, we're gonna hold space and think of the family of Jordan Wabas. And Beulah is not back yet, or else she ran away, <laughs> either or. It's okay, we can take a minute to think and give her an opportunity when she returns. Next, we're going to take a moment and hold space for the family of Reggie Bushy. Rhoda is one of you. Rhoda, did you want to say a few words? We're not forcing you, but we would love it if you want to. <laughs> Going, 
Mission go again. Game Families. Okay, 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 I go get two sisters, go up and I go to the hospital. I go get my brother, 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 my my <laughs> sister <laughs> Anderson. <coughs> Next, we hold space for the family of Robin Harper. <coughs> Tina, did you want to say a few words? I'm glad to see the other mothers that are here. Robin was uh, my baby girl, and she was so excited to come out for school. She said, um, I see my friends coming out too, and she wanted to come. She had dreams. And she never made it home. I see other moms and families, and I know that I'm not alone in this healing journey. And I, I thank you all, all the hard work you're doing for their, for the other students, for their dreams. Mira, thank you.
Nem, correto. Now we hold space for the family of Jordan Wabas Bula. Did you want to say a few words? Hello. Um, I'm going to say that um, I'm glad that I came out because I wanted to come out when I was told um, about this um, this forum, and um, I know it's not just only about Jordan and us, and for the future of our present uh, youth. And uh, what happened to Jordan? I'm sure um, everybody know by now, through the media and, um, and all. And, um, When I first heard uh, that he never made it home on Monday night on February 7th, I didn't know until the next day, in the evening, when after I was done my work and I was doing my laundry. That's when, um, that's when I first uh, found out And um, I'm sure that we kept on uh, checking Facebook, my daughter and her family, her husband, and also other, uh, his other friends. <coughs> so finally, uh, my daughter decided to come out they were um, he was my daughter was going to come out for that later on because there was a youth uh, conference that week and so she had two youths coming out one of them was her son and the other one a friend and uh, <coughs> That didn't uh, that didn't happen. So they used uh, one of that student seat for another passen passenger to get on, which was my uh, my son-in-law. And still, uh, I kept checking Facebook. And still there was no uh, no word so I came out the next day I came out with uh, with my other uh, with my other grandson and um, ever since then um, there was still no word. And uh, we uh, somehow, um, I got through the whole, uh, the whole time, 
trying to look for him. Now times um, I went alone too, because I wanted to, I still wanted to uh, try and find out any signs. And I had uh, close calls of getting into accident. But, um, but somehow, I, um, I was okay. And all that time, I thought, why? Why didn't I just have that accident? And no one, no one was around. But, um, but that didn't happen. Maybe I was given to try to still look for my, my grandson. And so today I'm still, I'm still waiting for an answer. since it's been over 12 years now. And um, what I want for this, um, for this uh, forum regarding about uh, the students coming out to high school here, I know one is from um, NNEC and the other one is from Madawa. Madwa area. After listening to all these uh, presentations, all of them have the same uh, same idea and care for these uh, young young students that they have to leave home. But I know they still have fears to be out on their own. And, uh, and this um, circle of care, what they're, uh, what they're doing now is good, like uh, cultural, cultural and traditional healing and the way of life is good. It's good for them. And also, um, <clears throat> I'm glad there's more uh, more counseling for them that they can go to. But still, I know some students have a hard time to ask for help. And, um, And also, um, what I wanted to share is, um, I know all these kids were baptized, and uh, I know most of them must have already been confirmed, but sometimes we don't have our confirmation yet. And uh, I want I wanted to see, uh, to get these students, uh, both from Dennis Franklin Comedy High School and Madwa Learning Center, for them to get um, get teachings about the, the Bible, about our uh, religion, because we are all baptized and we still need to have connection with God. And no matter how we pray, we still pray to God. And um, I know at times, um, <coughs> especially the youth don't wanna, don't wanna go to church, but still we have to, let them know
even me even with me sometimes um I don't go to church, but sometimes I do. But back home, uh, we lost all our uh, reverence. They all passed to the spirit world. And every time we have uh, funerals, we have to get the reverend from another community to come. And even when they have uh, baptisms too, when there's more than two, then, then that's when uh, we call for the reverend or the bishop to come. And I know um, this journey, this journey of healing, is still very difficult for us with all these uh, young, um, young youths. They were all happy to come here to further their education. And I know it was new to them to come out on their own, even though some of them probably they weren't that um, ready yet, but I know they they wanted to um, explore or learn more about stuff. Because I know uh, one time, um, I'll show you something uh, regarding one of my niece. That was before uh, we had airstrips. And she never uh, left the community. I think she was about 10, around 10 years old or less that time. Then she had a toothache. And so uh, they finally made arrangements for her to go to see the dentist. And the dentist was, um, I believe it, they found one in Wanaman, Wanaman Lake. So uh, my niece was very uh, nervous to go because she's never been on a plane, on a float plane before. Well, anyways, she finally, uh, finally had the courage to get on that plane with me. And she was very, um, she was nervous at first and she really uh, looked very surprised that there was more. As soon as you get up on the plane, there's more behind that horizon. That's what that's what I mean when uh, these young kids leave home for the first time, even though they've been uh, going to nearby communities and. Um, I know we all want our kids to have good education. And, um, and help each other. Because I know at, at the moment, uh, back home, uh, our, our youth are still um, struggling could be with uh, lots of issues. And, um, and um, I'm very happy to get this, um, all these uh, care for you to be ongoing and giving and we have to give all our support to and to encourage them that life is um, could be you know life is not easy they're going to face good and bad times losses 
and gains of um, gains from um, the young people's um, future uh, children. And, um, and uh, also Jordan had the dream, his dreams too. But, um, but that was cut short. So um, <clears throat> we still, I mean, um, at first uh, my grandkids, my grandkids had a hard time to be, to go out on the lake. Because that's where Jordan was found floating in the river. And um, I knew I had to help my uh, grandsons, and eventually I did. I took them out to go canoeing. They have to go canoeing. Try to get over that um, what they felt. I know it's hard, um, especially to the kids when they lose their family member, especially. Um, Suddenly, I know it was a shock for us. Same with these other, uh, these other youths of these young people. But uh, we must continue on to help these young um, youth. Yeah, Miigwech. Next, we hold space and honor the family of Kyle Morriso. I don't know if there's any family here that wishes to speak. My mother, Lauren Marshall, was supposed to be here speaking, so I'll speak for her. She's still in her room. She had a late night last night. <coughs> I just wanted to say thank you to Nan for flying us out here, the family, for bringing us together once again. I'm glad to hear about all the programs that's been put in place for these students to keep them busy and to try their best to stay away from drugs, and alcohol. If some of you weren't aware from, <clears throat> I lost my father, Christian Marshall, about four months ago, if you guys weren't aware of it yet. They found him at, uh, <clears throat> they found him at the landmark in his room. They found him early in the morning, laying back on his bed. I wasn't informed by any official or the corners. Nobody informed me of it. I had to find out through uh, online or through the news. 
And that's uh, an another reason why my father's not here today, why you don't see him here. Back when the inquest started, before the inquest started, my dad sent me out here to speak on the behalf of the Marshall family and my brother Kyle. He told me he wanted me to sit in the front seat to speak, speak for the family, to have a voice for the other families too as well. I drew a picture here while I was listening to uh, Panaji's speak. I don't know if you can, it's not, oh, I thought it was on the, well, I drew, it's, it's called the spirit room. I don't know if you guys can see this. It's uh, seven fishes going into the spirit realm, or heaven, as you guys would call it. And there's one guy right here that's pointing the way to the spirit realm, and that's my late father, Christian Marshall. Well, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Next, I would like to take a moment and hold space, all of us to hold space for the family of Jethro Anderson. I don't, is there a family in the room? No. I didn't think so. And last, but definitely not least, let's hold space and thoughts for the family of Corinne String, who could not be with us at this gathering. So many people are doing such amazing work to bring the recommendations to life. But I pray we never forget the price that was paid for us to have those recommendations and the price that will be paid again if we don't take the work seriously. And I want to honor all the people that are doing so much work as the families have said the families are working hard too. If there's one thing I'm so proud of our cultures in that we acknowledge grief is hard but we don't run from it. We acknowledge it. We sit in it. We hold space for it. We cry the tears. We sit in silence because we know that working through it is the only way to get to the other side and that denying it only extends the journey. So even though it's way more fun to sit at a comedy festival, <laughs> I'm so thankful that we're doing this because this is what makes the difference. The policies are amazing. The programming is amazing, but this is the route. Those seven fish, I would love to get that image up somehow if you wanted to share it. Now, our next event is at 
12.30. No, 11.30 is our lunch break. Now, Maggie, I believe you had said that you were going to be kind enough to do a prayer. You just remembered that. That was adorable. <laughs> if anyone was looking at her, you saw the moment of recognition in her face. Oh, right. I said I was going to do that. The question is, do you need the spirit plate to do that prayer or no? Okay. Then if you want to come up to the front, I don't even think the food's out yet. Uh, was it scheduled for 12? I hope not. <laughs> As staff start scurrying and panicking. <laughs> because at 12.30, we have Pam Palmer here. I don't know if you guys know who that is, but I intend on fully fangirling over in the corner <laughs> when she speaks. Uh, but Maggie, if you could make your way up to the front while the staff scurry around. <laughs> awesome. This is why I don't do event planning, because that's stress I don't want. <laughs> Over here, or either side. Okay, I'm just going to pray and ask the Creator to bless us with the good food, whatever is coming. And now. Uh, Ask him to be with us for the rest of the day as well. Oh, Bojon, the Kit Kishamando, Makao de Queni, Bishop Kang Donji, Namendo with them. Jimmy was kidnapped Kishamando, Nongum, Hagjabago, Kinagon, I gain on the man. Eguke, I gain on the winan. I got kicked one. We got syndicate. We got a just uh, a little thought here. Uh, yesterday we forgot a whole bunch of things, <laughs> and one of them was for, for the dinner. And my sister Lucy said, I'm sure glad there's two of us. <laughs> but we still forgot. <laughs> yeah, I forgot too. <laughs> Living proof that sometimes a whole bunch of brains and it still doesn't work. <laughs> Okay, so as mentioned, we're now going to break for lunch a few minutes early. We have to be back here right at 12.30 for the next keynote so we can wrap up this afternoon. Remember to laugh. Remember to move around. Remember to have some water during your break. That's just how we're kind to our bodies. Miigwech.